so I would, uh, this is a, a, a QCon uh, exclusive here, uh, where we can reveal some exciting new research. Um, research from the uh, University of Sledgeham on the Wold has revealed that the correct number of microservices that you should be running is 489. Uh, this number was calculated, and I quote from the paper, by taking the total distinct code concepts that can be written in melted cheese on the number of pizzas a two-pizza team <laughs> eats during an average sprint and dividing it by the mean average of your desired unit test coverage and the coefficient of the number you first thought of. <laughs> so, uh, that uh, is, uh, obviously arrives at 489. I'll let you work out the maths for yourself. And this would be of... Um, great and uh, uh, propitious import uh, to the entire software engineering industry if I hadn't just made it up, uh, which I did. So uh, that's, that's completely fake. So chucking that out of the window, um, we can now start to ask the question, why 489? Why did we come up with this concept of stating a number of microservices that should be run in production? Uh, well, uh, this came out from a tweet that you have already seen uh, about the, uh, the, uh, that has been shown around at various uh, sessions in QCon um, from uh, Monzo, who we will be talking uh, to a representative of later, about the number of microservices they ran in production and what their, uh, you know, what their, their software architecture looked like. And they got a load of tweets uh, saying, well, that's, that's completely rubbish. You know, you're, you're running far too many microservices in production, far too many. How can you possibly know what's going on? And that raises the question, well, what do you mean? What, what is too many microservices? How do you know that you're running too many microservices or indeed too few? And so what we wanted to do with this session was explore that concept from a number of different perspectives. And I have uh, with uh, me in the audience, so I'm going to slowly invite up on stage, three guests from um, very uh, different organizations who have taken very different approaches uh, to the number of microservices uh, in uh, their systems landscape and how they've designed uh, that landscape, or indeed how that landscape has evolved over time, uh, whether by design or not. Uh, so I'm going to call them up on stage. Um, I'm going to quiz them about what they have in production. And then at the end, I'm going to turn the floor over to you to quiz them for me. So, I would like to, without further ado, invite the first one of my guests up, uh, who is Sarah Wells, uh, the Technical Director for Operations and Reliability at the Financial Times. Please welcome Sarah. So, how are you? Fine, thank you. Good, excellent. So, uh, my first question to you um, is going to be, could you describe for us um, what the, uh, the, your system's landscape is like at the Financial Times. Uh, okay, I in in so, a brief paragraph, if you so could. So if anyone saw Luke's talk yesterday, um, you'll know that we have got pretty, any, pretty much anything you could have probably exists somewhere at the FT. So we have teams that are deploying Node apps to Heroku. We have teams that are building Lambdas probably in Node, maybe in Java. We have uh, teams running Containers, we're kind of gradually moving towards EKS, but we've probably also got people on ECS being stored. We have a, a whole ton of stuff. And we've still got systems, systems that sit on a, on a VM, like probably still got some Java apps running on Tomcat. So, and it's not just that, we also have, so, so we kind of opened up uh, people's choices maybe four or five years ago. So rather than saying this is the message queue you should use or this is the database, we basically said if you can make a case for why this is a good thing for you, you can do it. So we have a lot of different databases. I mean, we, I think we have three different uh, ticket tracking systems. We, we Basically, it's a bit of a free-for-all. So you really have taken the concept of developer autonomy quite far there. <laughs> we have. What's interesting is sometimes you find people do see something and go, this seems really good. So you do get people coalescing around particular technologies where they've seen another team use it and they think, hmm, yeah, that would work for me. So I don't think we've got anyone using a graph database that isn't near for J. Got a lot of people using Circle CI. You, you do find that people uh, move towards the things that are clearly easy to use and provide value. Mm. So um, in reference to our uh, talk title, 
Uh, how many microservices would you say are at the FT? So it's quite difficult to say. I think once you have a lot of microservices, you, you probably don't know how many. So I can say how many systems we have, because we track them in a, in a business operations uh, store. But which of those are microservices, I don't know. What, what I would say is it's the, pretty much the standard architectural pattern. And some of our bigger um, groups, for example, building the FT.com website, our content uh, platform and APIs, have around 150. And then we have other teams that maybe have 10. They're doing smaller chunks of work. Um, and obviously, if people are writing lambdas, they could have quite a lot of individual lambdas. So um, one thing I think that people will be uh, someone might say if they came along and saw, you know, this 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 sort of vast um, landscape with many different uh, different approaches taken uh, across the uh, across the landscape as a whole. They may ask, how can we be sure that this is resilient? You know, how how can we be sure that uh, each because uh, you know then you've got to measure the risk of each individual team, you know, and, and uh, whether they can run their system in production effectively. So how do you manage to you know, m mitigate the risk of like, one individual team going off the rails, as it were, and doing something crazy? So we've gener I mean, you, you couldn't do the kind of approach we've got unless it really was you build it, you run it. So we, do, we provide standards and guardrails for people to say, we expect you, this is a critical system, we expect you to be in two regions. Um, if it's maybe less critical, you've got to be in two availability zones. We've got security standards. We have other standards that say, here's how you should uh, represent the health of your system. But we have to, you, if you're going to empower your teams, you have to actually trust them as well. The, the best thing you can do is, is trust them, but make sure you can pick up where they've got it wrong. So a, a simple example would be, we have information in our business operations store that says, does this system handle personal information? If it handles personal information, you've said yes it does, and you have an S3 bucket, which is tagged with that system code, and it's open, we're gonna basically flag that to you. Did you mean to make that bucket open? So I think that providing that kind of checking is, is sensible, sensible mm. approach. Yeah, so it, uh, it's interesting how you would decide when, when you would you know, impose those sort of rules across the, uh, across the landscape, and when you would just say, actually, you know, we will let people go free in this particular instance. So it is about risk. We probably don't always get it right, but we, we definitely have this categorization of this is a brand critical or this is a business critical system and it has a higher standard required. For example, we will phone people up out of hours for that. And actually, as soon as you have a system where you could be woken up out of hours, you take that much more seriously in terms of the resilience. You will set yourself up so that you don't get phoned up when something could be automated. Mm. So with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess having lots of different um, approaches to microservices means that you might see different uh, sizes of microservices uh, almost. So I, I suppose that the question of how big a microservice should be is a, uh, one that has been you know, constantly with us since microservices came along as a, an idea. So what sort of approaches have you seen to that question? So I don't, like all the things people say about how big a microservice should be don't make sense. So if it's a thing owned by a team, then it's also not something that fits in someone's head. If it's a couple of hundred lines of code, then you're probably, you know, we have maybe five teams that between them have 150 microservices. But I think what we've found is useful is, is be prepared to recognize where you've got it wrong. So if you have got some microservices, and then you find that there are four of them that you always end up releasing at the same time, then they're not separate. So can you combine them? And we've particularly done that around services that we're writing into a graph database. Did we have one service that did reading and writing of a particular type of concept, or did we separate those out? Because when we read, it's a kind of a different thing we're trying to achieve, and we've moved between that. So recognizing that, that um, there's some pain here, therefore we probably ought to change our approach, uh, is quite effective. Mm. That's a great metric, the metric of, you know, are you deploying this at once, therefore it's... Well, it's the, have you actually got mic microservices or do you have a distributed monolith? Yeah. Um, and I think unless you can genuinely, independently deploy something, then, then you're not, it isn't a microservice. And, if, and the other metric I think is useful to, to think about this is, are you actually managing to release things all the time? So if you have got a system made up of microservices and you're not releasing, a, you know, multiple times a day, I would 
wonder whether you're really truly getting the benefit for it. Because there's a lot of cost for having microservice architecture. Mm. Yeah. And we've, we've gone from, um, the website was 12 releases a year, um, say five years ago. Um, I think it's probably across the content platform and the front end, probably 4,000 releases. Recently, we've added a change API, and I think we're doing, we're doing about 40,000 changes a year. So the benefit, so there might be costs in terms of complexity and in terms of you know, making sure your code is split up and so on, but yeah. the benefit is this rapid release cycle that you, could, you can't do with a monolith? I mean, I don't know how long people have been coding, but do you remember like um, Git merges? But I just don't remember the last time I did a Git merge, you know, because we de basically you don't have a long-lived branch, and you you're doing small changes. It's not the pain that it used to be. And when mm. things go wrong, you're not trying to work out which of the many changes that you bundled together was the cause. Yeah. So that that uh, brings lots of benefits in terms of risk and mm. uh, resilience in itself. That that ability to uh, to do that. Mm. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much, Sarah. I'd now like to invite up uh, our uh, second. Uh, uh, second speaker, uh, who is uh, Suhail Patel, and he is a back-end engineer at Monzo. Please welcome Suhail. So, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, um, uh, this is quite odd, uh, someone from Starling interviewing someone from Monzo. Um, not the first of, time. No, no, that is true, <laughs> not the first time. Um, so, um, this, uh, a lot of the inspiration for this uh, this talk was the um, tweet that uh, Monzo sent out about the number of microservices in their architecture. And um, what sort of responses did you get from that tweet? It was really quite interesting because a lot of people like have this sort of like sticker shock reaction. Uh, they say, "Oh, 1,500 microservices," and then they look at like how many engineers do you have? We have we had about 150 engineers at the time, and you know people made an interpolation. Oh, that means 10 engineers per service, and you know we sort of wanted to run with that as a joke. Like, yeah. yes, you, you join Monzo, you get your 10 services, you treat <laughs> them like pets, you give each of them a name, and you know you you, you know you you care for them, and then they grow up. Uh, but th that's not. Really Really the reality. If you look at Monzo as an internal company, um, there's a lot of different domains that we are we are involved in. For example, we've built an in-house chat system. Uh, we've got a lot of business tooling. We've got an entire financial crime department. We've integrated with nearly 20 payment networks uh, and lots more uh, ongoing. All of these are like really complex pieces of, of software and architecture that we've had to build in-house. Um, if these were spun up into different companies, we would have tens of companies for each of the things that we have built. So what we've been able to do is build an architecture where we have some shared common abstractions, uh, but lots of different like, and separate entities and teams built around them. And you know that coalesces into one big 1,500 microservice number, but without context, it just is a sticker shock number. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, putting to you a question that um, uh, I was discussing with Sarah, so how do you know where the boundaries should lie between these abstractions? How do you know if, you, if you've split something down into too small a, a, you know, a piece? I think the release analogy that Sarah uh, had was uh, absolutely correct. If you're releasing these things in tandem, or if you've got some sort of coordinator service, or if they're sharing uh, data across microservice boundaries, uh, and you know, storing these data, storing these pieces of data in lots of different places, uh, then you might have not got it quite correct. Um, ultimately, the way we see microservices is it's a bounded context. If the thing is like, uh, ha you know, has a has its own data entity, its own data abstractions, you know, it fits within its isolated environment, can be scaled independently, deployed independently. I think that's the, the, the nice, the sweet spot of having a microservice. Um, so when you've got uh, you know, the new engineer coming on, and you know, they're not getting given their, their, their 10 microservices individually, but they're, you know, they're asked to do a certain task and so on. How do they know what's there already? How do they know if there is um, already something within the, you know, the 1,500 microservices that already does what they should do. Uh, that's a really good point. So one of the things that's not commonly talked about is the amount of tooling that 
is almost required when you get to any amount of microservice scale. Uh, so, you know, when you get to the hundreds of microservices, you need a set of common tooling that engineers are familiar with. So, uh, you know, right from the get-go, uh, engineers join with a, like, back in Engineering 101 to understand what sort of abstractions are provided uh, in, the, in the architecture um, and, you know, where they essentially insert their code, uh, you know, where the business logic is, Every single microservice at Monzo follows the same common set of patterns, even to the same file structure, uh, so that you can jump into any microservice and understand and jump into the code, uh, whether you're on call, whether you're a veteran engineer, or whether you're a completely new engineer. Uh, aside from that, like, you know, having good documentation and readmes is also really important. That's more like erring into like, the cultural uh, uh, side of things, you know, having good knowledge management and you know, sharing that context and having a forum for questions of like, whether a microservice exists, whether it's the right domain, whether it's the right scope to add this additional piece of functionality or to break it up further, uh, what is the history behind it is all really, really important. But those are more like cultural issues. Mm. If you're talking about services themselves, um, having documented API boundaries, uh, we use a lot of like uh, proto style API boundaries so that it's well documented, all the fields are there, uh, you know, they're marked as required or optional. Uh, that sort of stuff really does help. And how, how, what's the rate of change we're talking about here? So how many microservices are you adding a month? Um, I think it gets to about 100 per month, uh, like at the, at the absolute peak. Yep. Um, I, the thing is, uh, a lot of people are, are thinking of this as like a velocity. Like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, are we moving faster because we're adding 100 microservices this month? Or are we moving slower because we're adding only 30 this month? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's the right way of looking at it. When we have a new abstraction being built, uh, you know, if we're going to embark on a completely new project to add a new payment network, I mean, it's going to be pretty common that we're going to add 10 to 20 microservices to deal with all of the abstraction layers that are involved and all of the boundaries and a bounded context that we need to get involved. Like, for example, you open the MasterCard spec and it's thousands and thousands of pages of documentation. And, you know, you want to break those up into small individual components. Uh, I don't think, it, like, you know, number of microservices is a function of time. I think it's an evolution of, you know, when you're adding more complexity to your system, how do you break those down into individual chunks that are manageable and, like, you know, able to be retained in, like, some group of engineers' heads? Mm. I would say that uh, if anyone is having trouble getting to sleep, any insomnia, uh, read the MasterCard spec. Um, <laughs> it'll uh, cause you to drop right off. Um, so, because, uh, of, of course, as you add more and more things, this, this knowledge management of, you know, of making sure that you've got all of your, uh, your landscape documented and, uh, you know, and uh, you can pass that knowledge on, uh, that becomes a you know a, a difficult challenge in some ways. Absolutely, I, I don't think it's a solved problem. I don't think uh, like if anyone's looking at Monzo for the solution. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't think we've even quite found the perfect solution. Uh, what we can do is we can make incremental steps. So we've made a lot of advances in our tooling. Uh, so you know, being able to figure out uh, like where a microservice is, what revision is deployed on, and, and all of that stuff. Uh, you know, deploying changes is is really really easy. Uh, you know, there is uh, a code owner for every service. So you, at least you can go to members of that team. Uh, at least you know what is your starting point to go find out information. If a service is just sitting there in production and everyone's afraid to touch it, mm -hmm. then uh, you know, then then we've got a problem. Yeah. Uh, so I think tooling and you know some amount of documentation helps. For example, we run in a uh, in a single repository. We have all of our microservices in a single repository, and one of the benefits that brings is that you can do uh, essentially uh, uh, grep across the entire repository and and see what microservices are there like that fit your patterns. For example, if you do a grep for MasterCard, all of the MasterCard services and many more services <laughs> as well will, will pop up because mm. they have MasterCard like, named as variables or like, in comments and stuff like that, or even in the readme. Uh, so you know, it, these are all viable starting points. Uh, whether you're going to find perfect documentation to get to your endpoint without speaking to another human being, I don't think that's a problem that anyone has quite cracked. And I think this, this applies even for, like, if you have a monolith. If you're completely on the other end of the spectrum and you have a monolith, a one single binary that you deploy, one single application, even running on a single server, uh, you know, if you have lots of classes or lots of functions or even, like, lots of variables or one big function, like, all of these things are complexity. Uh, and all of these things, you're going to have to speak to other humans and gain context about why was this designed in this way? Uh, what what were you taking into consideration? Uh, what was going through people's minds? That sort of stuff is not really explicitly documented at every step. Yeah, we still haven't managed to get rid of humans yet. Um, no. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so how, how do you, do, does this, uh, keep, keeping everything in one repo, does that lead to any sort of anti-patterns developing in terms of coupling or in, in you know, uh, coupling that is inappropriate between microservices? Yeah, like one of, one of the things that, that really comes up is uh, at what point should something graduate to a library? Um, so, you know, like if an abstraction is used in like one place over here in an isolated uh, uh, microservice and then it, a similar abstraction is built for another microservice, you know, at that point you come to a logical conclusion, oh, well, this should be a library so we can share some code. Um, like, for us, like, uh, for something to graduate into a library uh, means that we are adding another layer of support and analytics and metrics and, and uh, like, you know, expertise uh, around it. So I think, uh, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the themes I've seen going around at Monzo and one that I re really agree with is uh, you don't really want something to graduate into a library until you've written it like a few times so that you can understand what is the best interface to provide to engineers uh, to make the most effective use going forward. Uh, you know, have you captured all the different uh, problem space? Uh, you know, if you're writing something once, you're like, okay, right, I'm going to graduate this immediately to a library. You might solve your specific problem, but you, then you might get the interface wrong for, for other people. And then changing that is going to be a pain. Mm. And, you know, something that we've experienced as well and something that we've had to do, uh, you know, being in a, in a single repository, we can do checks to make sure that things can continue to build and using a static typing language like Go, uh, that kind of stuff helps, but it's still pain. Uh, you know, we have to now educate engineers uh, to make sure they're now doing it in this new way and not the old way, and where's the new documentation, and that migration path is just painful. Yeah. So one thing that does differ between microservices and the monolith is in a monolith, if a class is calling another class or a function is calling another function, then you know, the, the time you've got to take into account of that is the processing time of the various mm -hmm. classes. Whereas if a microservice is calling another microservice, there is additional time uh, taken for that, you know, that call to go across the network. Yep. So with 1,500 microservices where you know, a simple uh, you know, make a payment, say, uh, or, you know, I'm trying to pay for something on my card at a supermarket, that's going to have to go across many, many services. So how do you take into account that sort of, you know, the, the latency that appears not from the processing, but from the, you know, call to call to call to call to call, you know? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I'm going to invert it ever so slightly uh, and say that if you ask most engineers who work on a monolith-style system, and that's something that I've worked with in the past as well, uh, you know, in a monolith style system, there's a lot of things uh, like performance wise or latency wise that engineers don't really take into account. So, for example, what if your program has a GC pause right in the middle? Uh, that's going to ruin your latency budget. What if your disk gets slow? Like, what if you run out of, like, if you're running uh, on Amazon, uh, you're running on EBS, your EBS burst balance depletes. Uh, you know, your, your disk access is going to get a lot, lot slower uh, than what you usually expect. Um, if anything, by surfing, surfacing uh, the fact that you're going over a network means that, you know, there's some amount of resiliency and reliability that you need to take into account. Now, I do agree that, you know, your, your reliability might go from near enough 100% to 99 and a few more nines uh, percent. Um, and we don't try and hide that fact. You know, we tell engineers that, yes, you know, crossing an availability zone boundary is probably going to add one millisecond hop uh, a latency uh, to your application, but you can't rely on that, right? That's not a guarantee that anyone gives. You know, we don't control the network. Amazon controls the network, and even they don't get it 100% perfect. If anything, like, don't try and hide the abstraction uh, that you're going over the network. You know, instead of, uh, like, in your application, make it explicit that this is now a network call, uh, and to take into account whether you need, like, a, uh, do you have a real hard time, real time de uh, deadline, or is this like a soft, like, you know, ideally in the, in the 99th percentile, you want to try and get it within this amount of time budget, but occasionally it might go over. And that's the reality with most applications. If you have a GC pause, like, you can't give 100% guarantee. Mm -hmm. um, so the same, the same sort of thing applies. Whenever you're, you're touching anything that goes outside of, like, CPU or memory context, even memory can get slow. Uh, how, you know, RAM, RAM disks fail all the time. Uh, yeah, yeah, it all happens. Computers are, are, are fickle. Uh, much like humans. Uh, thank you, Suhail. Um, so please do um, think of uh, questions that you want to ask because we will be coming to you shortly. But first, I want to introduce um, my third panelist, uh, who is Nikki Wrightson, the principal engineer at Skyscanner and the runner of the, the track host of the microservices track from yesterday. So please welcome Nikki.
sure I was going to kick that. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's quite a small stage up here. Um, mm. So, um, for, uh, for the benefit of those who uh, haven't heard the, the Skyscanner talk from uh, yesterday, could you describe the sort of architecture of uh, Skyscanner and some of the... Uh, unique challenges that uh, Skyscanner faces? So I can really only talk to sort of the, the data platform, uh, as that's my area. Um, and we, we deal with two million messages per second entering. Uh, so every single thing about our world is scale. Uh, this is every, every paradigm that you've learned before and bring to, into your next job breaks. Uh, you cannot, you have to innovate at that scale. Yeah. So you're, you're facing this rather, uh, well, I would say probably for our panel, fairly unique constraint of processing that many messages per second. Um, and so you have uh, a different, you have to take a different approach. So what are the, some of the rules that you, you know, that you often hear or principles you hear about uh, your you know, microservice architecture that you have to sort of go, man, it's just not going to work with this many messages. So it's less about the microservice architecture in the standard sort of typical way of several hops in via a, a queue. We want to flatten that. So we make that as, as short as possible because, of course, you get that many messages if you don't scale properly. And when, we, when I talk about scaling, I'm just going to do one example, is that we have an ECS cluster, and this is just for writing to our ELK stack, that we had to ask AWS to, to add more, more nodes to because we had 4,000 containers running in this. this. And that's just for our logs. Uh, so if you start, if you don't horizontally scale and keep that kind of vertical movement short, you just end up with backlogs and you just can't process that amount of data. Yeah. Um, so. The, the, I, I guess that what you're dealing with there is you're dealing with a lot of problems where um, you, don't, you don't actually see the, uh, you know, each individual problem. You're seeing sort of volumes of problems almost, you know, the probability of a problem happening and that sort of thing. I, I, exactly that. So um, we, I, I, I came, I was previously at the FT where we, we could have really great observability in all of our microservices, but it doesn't mean anything at that scale because one message really doesn't mean much. So you're definitely looking for trends, you're looking for anomaly detection versus it's all about the metrics at this point. Mm. So you're, you're, you end up being, I suppose, with that sort of monitoring, you end up being sort of what, you know, another step removed from the, you know, the, uh, the underlying systems that you're running. Definitely. You can be opinionated, but you can't, you can't delve into it and reason about what, what you're actually transporting from A to B. And it's, it, the monitoring has to evolve too. Um, I hope that it was spoken about at the at talk yesterday, <laughs> but we traditionally sort of check if something enters the system and then comes out of the system just by comparing. You can compare in an RDS, anything like this. You can't do it at that scale. It just breaks. So we're, we're using problemistic data structures to give us an indication of when there might be an issue, mm. uh, which was quite a funky uh, solution. Yeah. So um, could you give us an example of that? How does that, you know, how, how, how would a, uh, you know, probabilistic data monitoring work? So um, I'm not a huge expert on this actual part of it. Uh, Herman was definitely the person. <laughs> um, but basically, it's just saying that uh, given a set We've got the probability that it's, we, we're always going to get a, def, a definite answer of when it's not there. Or no, the opposite way around, when it is there. Yeah. So you, you can compare and contrast if you get the same answer from both sides. So you're just actually trying to do more like set logic than, than, uh, than actual comparisons. Yes. Indeed. I imagine that, uh, that debugging problems and investigating, investigating <laughs> production issues must be uh, a whole different ball game in that circumstance. It, it is. And the, the trouble is that we end up breaking things that you don't find on the internet. Mm. We, we, we regularly break AWS. AWS <laughs> uh, use us and they, they're quite proud of the fact they use us for testing. <laughs> So you are sort of essentially a chaos monkey for AWS. Exactly that. That's yeah. <laughs> um, that's a fantastic side business to run, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, it, it does make life interesting. Yes. No. That, that's uh, so. How 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 do you approach it then, trying to fix a problem? Because you you know obviously 
you, are you just like you know throwing some stuff at the wall to see what lowers your error rate or so we can definitely reason about things we're we're in the massive process of trying to um sort of uh, separate the uh, concerns of our system. So as we isolate at least the different types of data, we can isolate the problem a little bit better. Uh, our metrics are good as well, so we can often see where traffic is stopping or slowing down. We've got quite advanced sort of uh, monitoring of uh, latency through the system, uh, which is, is definitely the, the indicator that something's gone a bit wrong. Mm, yeah, so, so you've sort of... In some ways, I imagine you can sort of abandon stack traces at this point, and it's oh uh, yeah yeah no, no you don't one's... look at logs yeah no one <laughs> it's uh, yeah I suppose when you've got uh, however many clusters it was four hundred clusters worth of logs then you... four thousand oh, sorry four thousand <laughs> I was only off by one order of magnitude there um, yeah so when you've got that many logs uh, log clusters then looking through the logs is just pointless just, really it, yeah. it does become pointless yeah um, so. Um, when you're when you're trying to control this system, and you're sort of you know sitting sitting one step back and having this uh, you know this this system run before you, mm. how do you sort of um, scale up and scale down automatically, or or n not even manually do that, but you know automatically create the system to scale up and scale down, in in order to uh, control the latency without overshooting, over provisioning. Uh, or provisioning in such a way that another system ends up getting too much traffic and slow down? So we've got a couple of different auto-scaling methods, but uh, the, the one that I'm kind of most familiar with is actually we, we've uh, got this Go application that routes all of our traffic. Uh, and this is like the most critical application in our world. If that goes down, Skyscanner's in trouble. <laughs> um, and... We, we scale that via CPU, uh, and there's an interesting reason why we scale it by CPU, and it's not a good one. Um, <laughs> we haven't actually put a limit on how many, uh, how many processes it can spawn. And we found out the hard way that if we didn't do CPU, it would just uh, out of memory, because it would keep one, it wouldn't scale, mm. so it would just go one and then bang. Yeah. Um, but we, we do over-provision. Uh, sometimes we do it manually when we see things are going a little bit mm -hmm. wonky. Um, it will do some auto-scaling, but there's certainly been times where, uh, for example, um, they were in Japan, uh, there was a talk show, and they, put, they showed Skyscanner on their phone. Uh, this sent an unbelievable amount of traffic immediately to the site. And we, uh, we're running on ECS, we could, it wasn't scaling quick enough. And then we were failing over to another region, which, of course, it was knocking out the next region and yeah. so on and so forth. Yeah, I imagine these sort of cascading problems it must be a, a, a worry that you have to deal with. Yeah, we've now, we've now deployed that to four regions. We're hoping to go to ten. So, yeah, all over worldwide deployment, yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, uh, well, I, you know, from Starling, we can we can empathise a little bit with the the being unexpectedly displayed on a talk show and then you know um, having your uh, your system suddenly overloaded, although not by the same extent, I imagine. Um, cool. Thank you very much, Nikki. Um, so I'd now like to um, throw things open to the uh, to the floor and get you to see if you have any questions uh, for that. So we have a question right over there at the back. Our uh, Thank you very much. Greg is doubling up as the uh, our charming assistant here. Thanks. Um, hey. And if I could, sorry, just before we begin, just to set expectations, if I could ask, um, if you have a question, please have a question. Uh, if you have three questions, pick one um, and try not to make a statement. If you have a multi-part uh, complicated question, I guarantee you that we will have forgotten it by the time you finish. <laughs> Uh, hopefully, it's just one question. Um, so we have a monolith in our platform, and I'm interested in looking at how we break it apart. And one of the things that um, I am curious about is how you think about um, the permissions and authentication between those um, services. So going off Sam's, Sam Newman's talk yesterday, talking about exposing an API in the monolith that a microservice could then um, consume from. But how, how do you think about authentication? To, to, do you just assume that because it's internal, like anything goes, or do you 
you something else. Yeah, what do you, what do, you do? Who wants to take that first? How do you make sure that uh, your traffic between your different services, uh, how do you deal with authentication? Or do you deal with authentication? Do you just go, you know, we've received a request from an internal service, it must be good? I mean, I'm happy to take uh, the, the first punt at that. Um, I think uh, assuming that everything internal is safe, uh, I mean, initially that might be okay, but I think, uh, you know, the moment you get to some scale, I don't think that's an assumption that can be made universally. Uh, you know, it only takes not even something malicious, but something accidental uh, to knock a, uh, another part of the system out. Uh, it's something that's like pretty, pretty common. Uh, you know, one microservice that shouldn't be talking to another microservice, and maybe it's got like a stale DNS entry and it's just flooding it with a bunch of traffic and it's not provisioned correctly. Uh, that sort of like accidental failure happens all the time. Uh, so it, for authentication specifically, uh, you know, we've embarked on a, on a bunch of projects. You know, we've got a centralized authentication service, uh, which is also responsible for internal authentication, uh, like, you know, just part of our zero trust uh, policy and defense in depth. Uh, being a bank, um, these sorts, sorts of things are, are really important and also regulated. Uh, so it's mandated, but also really good practice. Um, also, we've embarked on projects on uh, doing like network level isolation, uh, where we say, you know, a service uh, that is being deployed on our, on our shared multi-tenant architecture physically is blocked off using firewall rules to talk to a service that it shouldn't be talking to. So that means, you know, if you do get into one particular entry point, like one of our API entry points, uh, you know, if there's like a bug or like a, a, a security vulnerability uh, that hasn't been quite patched yet, maybe like a zero-day vulnerability, uh, you won't be have you won't have the ability to talk to, uh, you know, a critical part of the system like uh, you know our transaction service or our ledger. Um, are unauthenticated, but even via the firewall, uh, you know, your packet literally will not be rooted there. Uh, so even in the accidental and in the like uh, exploitation case, it just won't get there. So I would, um, we kind of distinguish between the microservices that make up a system and the, the relationships between those microservices and those that are part of another system operated by another team. What we found quite useful is to have an API gateway that sits in between that. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, so the first thing is we require you to have an API key, and we've recently made sure that we can tie that to a team rather than a person, and that's linked to a system code. So we know what system is making that call, and then you can add throttling. And this is a good idea because, you know, you, you as an owner of an API, are responsible for making sure that someone else doesn't take your API down. So when we were early on doing some microservices, we had a developer working on our website who managed to make 26,000 calls in parallel to one of our APIs and took down one of our clusters. And I treated that as our fault because we, were, we didn't have the throttle set correctly. It was an unscheduled um, resilience test <laughs> and it failed over to the other region and we were fine. But it's our fault. And the, but that combination of you can control at the gateway and you know who it is, is really useful. Um, I, I would also suggest that if anyone uh, does introduce a bug into production, use the phrase unscheduled resilience test <laughs> to uh, <laughs> describe how it goes. So, Nikki, that's a nice scanner. Well, it's a, it's a little bit of a mixed bag, actually, um, because, of course, the data platform needs to be quite open uh, because you've got, you've got apps. So we've got to have all of that data sent to us, and the only way you can do that is through public open APIs, but once it's in our world, we're actually doing more service-to-service -service communication rather than API calls. So we're, we're hitting an API, but it, it's then talking immediately to Kafka. So we, we, we do different sort of styles of uh, security there uh, and authentication on that side of things. Uh, and I, I, we've recently actually had Monzo's blog post sent around about their zero trust network. And, uh, and part of the work that we're doing on our Kubernetes world it is definitely going down that route and, and trying to leverage Istio as much as possible for them. Another question? Yes. Hi. Um, I, what I wanted to ask about was uh, when you have a lot of microservices, like you said, you know, what do you call it? 1,500 microservices. How do you design the database to cater for those microservices, especially with a bank when you can't get away with, you know, eventual consistency where you can cache and stuff like that? So, yeah, I just wanted to know how it works. 
uh, I guess this is uh, pretty specific to the uh, to the Monzo case. Um, one of the key tenants of our Microsoft's architecture is that uh, you share data by communicating. So you don't want uh, like different microservices accessing the same uh, particular underlying data in your database. Uh, it, you know, especially like uh, reads is a bit troublesome. Uh, but when you have mutations going on from different microservices, uh, that's where you're really in the problem land. Uh, when you've got uh, things touching the same the same underlying data, uh, they might not have the same guarantee. So you might not have the same locking primitives, or you might not have the same safety. You might introduce race conditions. Uh, you might not have the same deployment strategy, or a bug, uh, a bug can completely ruin your data, and then you need to resort to backups, uh, which is never, ever ideal. Uh, you might even have silent data corruption, uh, because you've got multiple things uh, touching the same uh, piece of uh, underlying data. Um, regarding the eventual consistency point and uh, caches, um, I think that really depends on like, the design and the primitives that you have around writing data. Uh, so for example, uh, one thing that we are pretty vocal about is we use Cassandra. Uh, and we use Cassandra for all of our uh, microservices. All of our microservices that need to store data are storing it in a, a, a Cassandra cluster. Uh, and that's something that, that we support. Uh, we've added a lot of abstractions and tooling on top to make sure that we have the consistency guarantees that we need for our data. Uh, of course, we want to make sure that we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, like locking primitives and stuff like that, but that goes beyond just storage of data. For example, if you're coordinating storage of data as well as calling a third party, for example, we integrate with lots of different payment networks, all of those might need to be integrated within the same like transactionality, uh, and it might not be enough just for your database to provide. So, Nikki, I guess that you know um, the uh, availability of database connections, and that's uh, that is uh, a concern when you're dealing with 2 million requests a second? Uh, yeah, we have a Kafka cluster of 77 nodes. So uh, that, that, That's quite a few. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's pretty difficult to reason about. Exceptionally hard to roll out any changes. We, really, really difficult. Uh, it took us two and a half months to, to, to change the AMI on every single one of those. Mm. Um, yeah, so does it, though, that's our our biggest pain point. Otherwise, we're completely in that segregation mode as well. You know, mm. we don't have two different services owning the same data. Mm. Um, and that's, that's the critical, critical point. Yeah, indeed. Anything else, or should we? Okay, well, uh, next question. Hey, I have a question with regards to like ownership as well as like keeping things up to date. Uh, you mentioned like code owners, that kind of stuff. Um, obviously, as, as you get a lot of services, maybe it's not reasonable for a single person to own them. Um, and obviously, holidays, etc., can get in the way. How do you kind of work around that? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm tech director for operations reliability, so I care deeply about knowing who owns systems. We've got a policy that everything should be owned by a team. Because, yeah, you can't have something owned by a person because they're working on something else, they might be on holiday, it's got to be a team, and everything has to be owned. Uh, it's not easy to make that happen when you've got thousands of services. But you have to, like, try and make sure that there's something that says you, you are the team that own this and expect people to maintain good documentation, to, to do things like testing, backup, restoring. We've, we've got a central um, system where we track information about all our systems and we actually score it. We score the operational information. We've kind of gamified it. So, you know, if you're a group, a team, you can look and see how you're doing compared to other teams in terms of having filled in the critical information. And that worked enormously well. Like, there are some very competitive uh, developers <laughs> at the FT and you get, like, comments in Slack of, hey, hey, we've just overtaken you again. <laughs> And like, I think my team's OKR okay, is we will be top at all points <laughs> because we wrote it. <laughs> so um, when, you, when you, you've got something um, owned by a team, what, what, what do they have to take care of? You know, obviously, the, the running of the system and the production and the documentation, is there anything else that they have to be able to guarantee? So if, they've, if they're using a platform that isn't centrally supported, mm. they need to make sure that things are patched. So, you know, if, you're, if you've chosen to deploy it on something different, you, you've got to make sure that you follow our patching policies, like high, high severity issues are patched quickly. Um, they, 
that things like uh, when we had to upgrade all of the code that used Node because there was a security vulnerability, and that was across you know, huge numbers of teams. They are responsible for doing that. If it's some a system where we need support overnight, they're responsible for being able to do that. Mm. But you still have some systems where, honestly, you know that no one actively knows this. Mm. But we do know who we'd phone. Yeah. And then we just have to hope. We have, you know, you, everyone has got some engineers who can find out what things are happening. Uh, uh, are happening operationally. Yeah. You just rely on those. How about hiring? Is hiring, you know, it, it, if, you, if you've picked a really obscure language for your system, do you have to be able to guarantee that you can hire people who could maintain it? It's interesting. So I think probably language is the thing we are least diverse in, and mm. that partly is because when you have a team who go, do you know what, I really like this testing framework in Scala, six months later you find that no one on that team is actively interested in doing that because actually they're all Java developers. Mm -hmm. So we've got fewer languages and that's not so bad. Um, and generally, I'd say that it's a mistake to hire for the technologies you're using now anyway. Yeah. Because you don't know what you're gonna be using. If we'd hired in 2013 for the technologies we were using there, it's almost no overlap. Um, you know, we, we were using, we were doing Java on Tomcat with Apaches in front of it, running on VMs, and now we're, you know, Node and Go on mm. containers. Yeah, hire people, not technologies. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to jump to, yeah. jump for one one more question. Oh, uh, that's, fine. that's right. Are you sure? Yeah. 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 Good. Uh, cool. Okay. Um, any more questions? One more over here. Hi, with the, it was mentioned that with such a large number of microservices that standards are important. How do you go about evolving those standards or introducing new standards maybe in response to something like a security issue or when you've got so much a state using, using those standards at any time? Evolutionary standards, who wants to? Well, it comes back, there's, there's several aspects to this. Um, we, we heavily invest in our tooling which means that you can cookie cut a uh, microservice that works with all of our health checks, all the logging, all the metrics, deploy it to production, probably within about five minutes. That's all it would take to actually create a useful service in production. Uh, and when you have such an easy way of producing new services uh, through a consistency, you can roll out changes through that. So a lot of our tooling comes into play. Uh, we do have a, a, a group that is sometimes effective, sometimes not at trying to document our, our principles, but generally engineers don't like reading Confluence pages. They just like doing stuff. So if you can bake it into the doing, then you're in a lot better place. Um. For for engineers themselves, like evolving standards, uh, like you know, when you we also have the same like cookie cutter like uh, uh, service generator approach, uh, and you can deploy something uh, very very quickly. Uh, if you want to evolve that, for example, let's say you want to change the structure that uh, engineers will will uh, go towards, and like you know, propose a migration plan. I think uh, getting others on board uh, and like showcasing why this is a better approach. I think if you're always permanently stuck in one static way, then you won't evolve and essentially you will fall behind and you know the, the layers of complexity will catch up to you or you'll have a bunch of people who like go off the beaten path uh, and, and just go do their own thing and then now you've ended up with a, like a completely uh, unmaintainable mess uh, because people are frustrated with the current controls and the current restrictions. Uh, so you know, there is an element of satisfying uh, both sides, uh, making sure that we have uh, uh, structure and harmony, uh, but on the other side, making sure that uh, people can propose change uh, and, you know, see that forward and explain why this is a better approach, why, you know, this might be more flexible going forward. And then once, you know, uh, people have committed, uh, going all in and committing. So, for example, uh, if there is a migration plan needed, then getting all the people on board, even everyone who was not entirely convinced, uh, getting them on board uh, and, you know, uh, doing, doing like a migration uh, and following the migration plan and, and, you know, making sure that everyone is happy on the other side. So you don't have a halfway house lingering around for nine months while you've got some old services and some new services services and like no one knows which is which and what should be done now. So there's a really interesting blog post that I think it was Slack recently published about how you can change the engineering tooling, the, the things that you have. And they said, you know, anyone's free to go off and investigate something because they think it sounds interesting. 
at some point you decide, oh, this is good, at which point you have to convince everybody else. And they said, well, you know, and you can make that easy, you can build tools, you can do communication, you should make it as easy as possible, but you're always going to have a long tail. And you, what you have to do is say, if we're committing to it, everyone is going to have to move, because otherwise you end up three years in with most things on GitHub, but some things in Bitbucket, and it's constant every time that you hit a problem, it's like, I've got to do it three times. But I, I, so I think that I totally agree that the, the two things that you really need to make it um, so that you're enforced to follow the standard, or, or at least encouraged strongly. The other thing that's quite useful is visualization. If you can show people whether, they're, whether they are complying with the standard, I think that's quite good. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think that's a good, good point to end on. Um, thank you all very much for being here. And uh, will you please join me in thanking Suhail, Sarah, and Nikki, your panel.